you can look at Bernadette. She joined last month. Yeah. <laughs> One month and a half, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and she will be talking about how to compress the three minutes. Mm, partially. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to be presenting to you one of uh, my previous works called uh, Too Many SDN Rules, Compress Them Using Mini. But before that, as I think most of you don't know me, so I'm going to introduce myself, what's my background, what uh, research did I tackle before, and then I'm going to talk about uh, SDN mainly, and uh, Mini. Okay? So what did I do before, where do I come from? So I worked before as a research and development engineer at Scope for IT services, so it was mainly on encryption methodologies. Then I did my master's in UBinet, so it's called Ubiquitous Networking in Sofia Antipolis, so it's University Côte d'Azur. And I did my PhD in i 3 SDNRS lab, entitled Next Generation SDN-Based Virtualized Network, so which is the main topic, going to be today. And then I worked as a research and development engineer on, on network automation at Orange, still in the south. And then I moved <laughs> to Paris area, so now I, since one month and a half, so October, I joined Nokia Bell Labs and I'm working, as uh, my colleague said, on AAIR lab. <laughs> so it's a fabulous uh, team in general, and it works on algorithms, analytics, augmented uh, intelligence research. So what research topics did I tackle before? I worked mainly on big uh, data distributed systems, on energy efficient routing protocols, and then for more, uh, like mainly my research work was about SDN, so next generation SDN networks, and network automation. So I'm gonna be concentrating mainly on SDN today. So first we're gonna, I'm gonna describe why do we need SDN, what was SDN, et cetera. So the problem with existing networks is that, so as we can see in this network, we have multiple types of network device, devices. Each network device has an independent control functionality. So we have switches, we have routers, we have firewall. Routers have to route data between different networks, switches are in the same network, etc. And in this system, we have, for example, the routers have to work together in order to send the information to each other. So they work in a distributed system. In such a scenario, they would have to require to have the intelligence and the forwarding, so the control plane and the data plane on the same network device. So in some scenarios, we can have some network and CPU overhead. Moreover, since we have different uh, network devices, they might even be from different vendors, they are closed boxes, we cannot program them. And it's hard to manage when we have complex network topology. So if you want to configure them, it's a bit, bit difficult. So for that, we have SDN, or Software Defined Networks. What's SDN? So mainly now we have forwarding devices in the network. It's simple forwarding devices. You just tell them what to do, and they do it. They don't have any intelligence. The intelligence is then centralized at the SDN controller. So now we have a channel between the forwarding devices and the SDN controller. The SDN controller in general is centralized. We can see later the variations of it. So in such scenario, the controller will have an overview or a global view of the network topology. So we can know everything that's happening. And the controller can consult the network applications, which are programmable, that allows it to adapt to network dynamics. So we can program anything, any new fun functionality that we want. We can just uh, include a different network application that we program. How does it concretely work? If you consider this topology, when a new packet arrives to an SDN switch, it will check first a set of rules that it has if it knows how to deal with this packet. If it doesn't know, it's going to forward the packet to the controller. The controller is then going to check the set of applications that it has. So it's going to analyze the packet, consult the network applications, and see what we have to do with this packet or with this type of packets in general. We call it as a flow. It's, going, it's then going to send the packet and the matching actions to the switch, and then it's going to install the list of uh, rules to be uh, used on these switches along the network topology. However, with every new technology, for sure we have some drawbacks. First, it was a centralized controller. Centralized controller means centralized uh, single point of failure. So if the controller fails, all the network is down. So we have now different uh, distributed controllers, such as Open Daylight and Onos. 
Then, as we said, so we have the controller and we have the control channel between the controller and the SDS switch. If you have a lot of load of traffic on these uh, links, we might have a bottleneck. So if you cannot reach the controller, there's a problem also. So for that, a lot of work has been conducted mainly to uh, select the flows that are going to contact the controller and decrease the load. Then we have the complex SDN rules. So on the forwarding device, the forwarding devices now, mainly the hardware one, have used a TCAM memory, which we're gonna see later on, which is expensive, et cetera, and it has restrictions. So this is uh, mainly going to be afterwards the um, subject of our talk, meaning. So what topics in general did I tackle in SDN? So the flow scalability, which I'm gonna detail later on. The network performance, which tackles the problem of the short flows, end to end delay. So in the network, some, most of you might know that we have, okay, big flows, like large flows from torrents, et cetera, or video streaming, and we have short flows. The large flows are consuming most of the network connection. The ones that are suffering are the short flow. Simplest example, uh, at home, one of your friends is downloading, I don't know, BitTorrent or streaming multiple movies or online gaming. You just want to connect simply to Facebook. And then you're like connecting on your browser and it's taking so much time. Because mainly it's using small flows. So you have a high delay. Then you have the energy efficiency, where as most of you might know, the problem here, we want to turn off network devices and then uh, in order to reduce the energy consumption, However, the problem with these solutions for now is that they are not applied in real networks because they impact the network performance. So we're gonna see how to implement such a solution without impacting the network performance in case of network discrepancy. So I'm gonna first talk at a high level about the two subjects, so network performance and energy efficiency, before detailing meaning. So, <laughs> In order to tackle the end-to-end -end delay problem, so how we can give priority for short flows in the network using SDN, we use coarse-grained scheduling. So the main idea, we have the controller that has a view over all the switches. What we can do is that we can monitor the switches and monitor the statistics to understand what's happening, to be able to identify short flows, large flow. Simplest scenario that I'm gonna present is that we have the incoming flows for every flow so every flow like we can consider as a connection. We install a rule. We monitor how many packets it has sent. If it's sent more than a threshold amount of packets, the flow is considered as a large one. It's deprioritized. However, the problem with such a solution is that we need one rule per flow. So in this case, it's not gonna scale. As I've said, we have the scalability problem with SDN switches. So we devise another one called the scalable scheduler. In this scenario, we consider clients rather than single flow. So a client is like, I don't know, this company or some subset of a network or a network application, et cetera. It's up to the network provider to define it. When a certain client bypasses an X percent threshold of the network user or the link user, the controller, the controller is going to zoom in into its traffic. So here we had a client three, single rule. Now we zoom in. What is it sending? How many different uh, flows does it have? And then we implement the stateful scheduler. So if it has sent more than X per, uh, amount of packets, it's a long flow. So we change its priority. Then we zoom out again to install the aggregated rules in order to minimize always the number of rules to be installed. So as a brief view, the uh, testing results have showed mainly that with a dumbbell topology, with a single bottleneck, we had enhancement in network performance, short flows were better than other scenarios. However, with big topologies, we had minor gains. And sometimes, it depends also on the uh, SDN switch that we use, we can stress the control plane and then we can observe some weird effects. So the other work that I have done, the energy routing, the energy aware routing. So, this one we're done on hybrid ISP networks. What are hybrid ISP networks? These are networks that are composed of both SDN and legacy nodes. In such a scenario, as I've said, in energy aware routing, we want to turn off links and nodes, and or nodes, in order to decrease the, network, uh, the energy consumption. However, the main thing that we want here is that we don't want to impact the network performance. 
So in order not to impact the network performance and don't have any losses, we suggest to use a smooth SDN link turn off. So to precise, we're turning off SDN nodes or links connected to an SDN node, not links between two legacy nodes. That one we cannot do anything. So we use smooth SDN link turn off mechanism. We use tunnels to read out the traffic and we try to anticipate link failures and traffic peaks. So I'm gonna detail the first one, how we smoothly turn off links. And you can ask me for the others if you want later on. So how can we turn off smoothly a link? So without losing any data traffic. If you consider an OSPF router connected to an SDN switch, how, will, how does the OSPF router work? It's going to send a hello packet to its neighbor and it's gonna wait for the neighbor to reply, to know that the neighbor is still alive, we can still send traffic to it. So the SDN switch is gonna reply normally. However, when our solution called Senator is going to notify the SDN switch that we want to turn off the link, whenever the OSPF router is going to send a hello packet saying, hey, are you alive? The SDN switch is not gonna reply. So it's gonna block all of its uh, control traffic. However, we're gonna still reply, we're gonna still accept all the data traffic in order not to lose any of the user's traffic. And only after that the OSPF router have reconverged, so it detects that the link is down virtually. And then it relays the traffic to other nodes, and then at that point, we're gonna turn off the link. So we know we're not losing any traffic. So we've, tested, we've done some tests here, uh, mainly on Atlanta, the one that I'm gonna show. So Atlanta topology composed of uh, 11 routers. We did a 50% of SDN nodes deployment. And then we have studied with a sinusoidal amount of traffic. So we've seen when the amount of traffic is low, we have the maximum number of nodes and links that are turned off. So sometimes we have variation in which link is turned off, it depends on the data traffic, whom sending it to whom, et cetera. Then when the amount of traffic increases, we notice that we're turning on some links and nodes again, dynamically. It's all happening dynamically. The traffic goes down, we're gonna turn off more and more, more and more devices. So what's the impact of this concretely on the data loss or packet loss? So we've plotted here in red the amount of packet loss in case we consider that all the links are up and we're using a legacy routing protocol. Classic scenario, supposed to have a low loss rate in case we have a high amount of traffic, which is our case. Then we compared it with our solution, Senator. So it's the green line. So we notice here that Senator performs as well or sometimes even a bit better than OSPF protocol, knowing that we have less number of nodes and links that are turned on. However, to study exactly the impact of using the smooth mechanism, we consider the scenario called Enator. So it's the blue curve. In this curve, what we have done is that, okay, we're using less number of nodes and links that are uh, up and running at a certain point. However, we did not shut down the node or the link using a, a smooth mechanism. So we might have some packets that are lost. And indeed, we notice that we have high peaks in the number of packet lost. So this is the generality of my work. Now we're gonna tackle mainly mini, mini. So the flow scalability problem in the SDN switches. First, we're gonna explain why do we need it. So. I'm saying that you have a scalability problem in the SDN switches, why? Well, in legacy uh, rules, we have a matching only on the single field and then you have the output port. If you consider routing rules, you have the destination, go to this port, that's it. With SDN uh, rules, we have more complex formal. So we have sometimes 12 to 41 matching fields and then we have a list of actions to be done. So the rule itself is bigger, more complex. Then in the TCAM memory, we have less amount of number of rules that can be installed. So we can see some of them, the most can be installed from 1,000 to 25,000 rules in the TCAM, so which is the hardware memory of the switch. And this memory is both expensive and power hungry. So we cannot like say, okay, let me just use the 25. The 25K is very expensive regarding the 1K memory. 
And you might say, okay, so we don't use the hardware, it's fine, we can later on install in the software memory like the RAM. Indeed, the RAM memory is way bigger than the hardware memory or the TCAM, if you want to say that the RAM is the software. However, we did a comparison, and we noticed that if we want to install a new SDN rule in the software memory or the RAM, it needs 10 more, 10 more time than the hardware memory, which is the TCAM. And if you only want to match, so a packet is coming, a rule exists, we just want to match and send the packet, it takes six times more to match it in the RAM than in the TCAM, so which is the hardware. So we have to try to fit everything in the TCAM or the hardware memory. Multiple works have tried to tackle the subject, so one of them suggests to insert a tag in the packet header. However, inserting any information in the packet header is going to require it to pass through uh, the CPU or through, because we cannot pass through the ASIC, so slow path a bit more time to treat it. There's officer which uses a default path. So we have a default path for all the traffic and then we create like branches from it in order to reach all the, uh, all the destinations. However, this means that we're not gonna use the shortest path. Everyone is transmitted on the same path in general, so we might have bottlenecks. We might impact the quality of service. Then we have XPath. XPath suggests to use a path ID. So it uh, identifies a path ID by, based on the network destination. And then beforehand, it compresses all the rules. So beforehand, we have to know which destinations do we have, and it compresses them beforehand in the uh, switches. So we compare our work against theirs, and we notice that though even our work is uh, dynamic, we have even better compression ratios. So what is MINI? So our MINI solution is uh, put on the controller. So we place it on the controller. It's composed of two modules, the routing module and the compression module. So when a new flow arrives, the routing module is gonna send the required routing rules, and then it's gonna check if you have reached, the th uh, let's say, the threshold or the um, full table limit. If the table limit has been reached, then we're gonna compress the routing rules. So the controller is gonna com do the compression, and then it's gonna send the compressed table to replace the existing routing table on the SDN switch. So how does the routing, how does the routing module work? Our routing module is like a classical one. Okay, we use the link utilization. However, we insert another uh, variable, which is the impact of the number of rules of our neighbor. So if we take this scenario, we have device one that wants to send a packet to device four. In such a scenario, we're gonna check the link utilization. Okay, in this case, they're all the same. We're gonna check the number of rules that are installed on our next hop. So in this scenario, we have two choices. Either we use device two or device three. Device three has less number of rules, so we prefer to use device three. Thus, our routing mechanism is going to, be, uh, to impact our compression. If you do compression of number of rules, our routing mechanism is gonna change. It's not gonna say the same. As for the compression module, so my colleagues, this work was done with the Kuwaiti team at Eneria and Sofia Antipolis. So they have proven that compression is MP complete. So we've used a three approximation heuristic that does a compression based on three tables. So we do a compression by source, compression by destination, and by the default rule. Then we compare the three tables and we select the smallest one, which is going to be used. I'm gonna illustrate this in an example. So we consider this routing table. So we have a flaw, like say, from source zero to destination four, send to port four, etc. We're gonna take all the rules that have the same destination. Let's say destination four. We check which is the most repeated port. In this case, it's port four, okay? So now we say from any source to destination four, send through port four. Any unmatching rule is gonna have a higher priority. Then we do the same for the source. So we take all the uh, rules with the same source, source zero for example, most repeated port is port five. So from, any, from zero to any destination sent through port five, any unmatching rule has a higher priority. We do the same for all remaining uh, sources. 
and we do the most repeated ports in the whole network, so the default port. Then we compare the, uh, we compare the routing tables. In this case, let's say B and C have, so compression by source and destination have the same size. So for example, we decide to send uh, table B, okay? However, since we're doing compression on source and destination, there's a limitation. So we cannot do compression on entry switches. So if you consider this routing topology, we're gonna explain why we cannot do compression on entry switches. If H1, let's consider that H1 has already transferred some data traffic to H3 and H4. So it used port one. If you consider that at this moment we had a compression, then it gets from H1 to any destination, go through port one. In this scenario, if H1 then considers sending a packet to H5, which is on S3, close, uh, slowest, shortest path is through port two, it's gonna be transmitted through port one instead of port two. We're not using the shortest path. So, to solve this problem, what we consider is to use virtualization. So we use OpenV switch, which is a virtual switch, or software switch, that we can install on the host node. So, since our solution is for the data center, virtualization is not a problem. It's commonly used in data centers. And in this scenario, data centers in general have and every host, 325 for a flow at the same moment. So we have to install maximum 325 for wording rule in an OVS, which is not a problem to have the best performance as it can handle between 1,000 and 200,000 rule in the kernel space, which is the equivalent of the TCAM for the server. We have tested many impact on, in an SDN enabled testbed. So we did experiments. We had four servers that are connected to an HP 5412 SDN switch. In this switch, we have emulated a FAT3 topology. So it's a K equal four FAT3 topologies. We have a 20 virtual switch inside this SDN switch. Then we connect it to the servers. In the same server, so here the color code, the machines that have the same color code are placed on the same server. Then we connect everything to the controller. We did testing scenarios, considering the case where we don't do any compression. So okay, our HPSDN switch limit is going to be reached. And then what's gonna happen? So we want to test that. What's gonna be the impact on the performance? Then we test the case where we uh, consider doing a compression single time for all the switches at the same time. When the HPSDN switch limit is reached, so we already have 65,535 rule installed. And the third scenario where we use mini, which does a dynamic compression. So with a limit of table of 500, 1,000, and 2,000. Since we have 20 virtual switch, some of them would reach 500 rules, 1,000, or 2,000. In every scenario, we have to do compression. Here we're considering traffic and all to all in order to maximize the number of, of flows. However, we only considered ICMP since we have emulated 20 virtual switch in a single hardware switch, which can support 200 SDN event per second. So these 200 events per second are going to be distributed between our 20 switches, so which is the maximum of 10 events. So we concentrate first on the compression. What's gonna happen, how the network load is going to be. So here we, not, uh, through all the time, if you check for the no compression scenario, the light blue curve, which uh, is at the same point as the compression fault, the black curve, we notice that at the beginning they're all increasing. The number of rules is increasing as new flaws are arriving, new connections are arriving. However, when the HP limit is reached, when we do a compression fault, we notice there's the sudden decrease in the number of rules. This is due to the compression. The blue line continues to increase as we have open the switches in the servers which continue to install some rules. The difference that we can see here is with mini. So which is the scenario of compression 500, 1000, and 2000. So green, red, and blue curve. We notice that at the very beginning to the 30 minute of the experiment, they still are increasing. Then we notice that they're increasing and then we have a sudden drop and it goes up again. 
This is a compression. Whenever we have a sudden drop, this is a compression and a switch. In all scenarios, we noticed that we had an 80% of efficiency. So we had 80% of compression on the virtual switches. If we zoom in to these switches, so remember we used a factory topology. We had axis, aggregation, and core level. So we have 20 virtual switch. On the axis switch, which is the one closest to the machine, to the servers, we had the least compression ratio. We had a 77%. This amount increased as we went up to the levels, so the core layer, which is the farthest point. We had a maximum of 96% in such scenario. This is due to the fact the difference between the first point and the last point is that, as we said, we have a routing module that depends on the number of rules, so the routing scheme is actually changing whenever we did a compression. So, what's the impact on the packet delay? So we sent some packets. Okay, sometimes we were contacting the controller. Why we did compression? So if you want to see the first figure, we compare it to the one of Mini. So the black arrow here is when the HP limit is reached, so we cannot install any more rules, and we still have additional flows that are coming to the controller, to, to the switches. In such a scenario, we notice that we have, here in the blue section, we have a lot of number of packets that have a high delay. So the delay suddenly jumped, because the packets here cannot actually match an existing rule. They don't have one. So they're obliged to contact the controller, every packet, contact the controller, so being sent back to the switch, go to the next switch, and then do the same thing again. However, with Mini, we don't have that. The small amount of packet is due to the number of packets that are still actually for, have to contact the controller because there are the new flaws arriving. The difference here, the big uh, problem is that, in the compression of 500, we notice that we have a huge increase in the delay. Why? Well, using a limit of 500 rules was not enough to install all the rules. So we had sometimes like 100,000 flow. You can, with the 500 rules, it was not possible sometimes. So you always, at a new packet arrival, we had to install a new flow. It was trying again to decompress the table. So we had in this scenario 16,000 compression which is not feasible. So this means that the threshold of the switch should be studied beforehand. We should know, okay, 500, no, it might not be enough for my traffic variation, etc. In all scenarios, we had a loss rate almost equal to zero. How much the compression takes time? So we studied here the duration of a compression. So compression duration is the time to do the calculation of the new compressed routing table, and then to send this new table and for it to be inserted into the SDN switch. So in the compression full where we had the most number of rules to install at a single shot, notice that we still have less than 20 milliseconds to install, to do all the calculation and install all the rules. In the dynamic scenario of mini, so compression 500, 1000, and 2000, we had in general max of 10 millisecond delay. So you might tell me, okay, but now since we're sending multiple rules, we're sending a full table at a single shot, how much it's gonna consume from the network? We're sending a big amount of chunk of data. Well, we show here that if you don't do first compression, whenever we saturate our uh, switches, the packets that have to be transmit, uh, transmitted to the controller, we can highly see their impact. We have a high solicitation of the controller. In the compression, 500, we have do dozens and thousands of compression. So yes, we have a high utilization of the network. In mini, where we had 1,000, 2,000, or when the full limit is reached, so we, we did a single shot compression, we noticed that we had a stable load between the switches and the controller. So it didn't impact the load. As long as the number of compression is stable, it's fine. So after doing the experimentation, we went on to test the scalability. So okay, now we had a topology, we had 16 clients per network, that's it. We had a K equal four topology, so it, it might be a small one. What's the impact on a large scale? 
So here we went through a simulation. So we considered two group of networks, of data center networks. The first one is FAT3 and VL2. The switches are the only entities that are forwarding data between a device and the other. And we have a group two topologies where the switch and the server itself are forwarding data between a device and the other. And in this scenario, so all the servers here that are forwarding data, so they have rules installed, we are not compressing the rules on these servers. Only that the switches are compressed. We notice here that even when we go up to 3,000 server, topology with 3,000 server, we still have a compression ratio of more than 65%. As for the number of compression events, so for a single switch, how many times did it have to compress to maintain the 1,000 limit? Here we're just talking about the 1,000 rule table limit. In the FAT3 and the VL2, so the group one topology, we had an average of one compression per switch. That's it. A single switch had to compress one time, and it was enough. However, with the group two, it went up to 56 compression per switch. Because in the group two topology, since we're not comp doing anything on the server side, the server side is doing a lot of variations. So when, as you remember that I said, we have the compression and the routing. Whenever we do compression, the routing module is impacted, which might still impact the second compression. However, if the uh, router or the server is not doing any compression, it has a high variety, and then it might disperse the routes more and more. It doesn't impact the uh, routing mechanism. So. We then compared the results when we used 1,000 servers. So we had all these topologies with each of around 1,000 servers per topology. We compared, so in the first type we had using 1,000 servers, a single switch had to maintain almost 400K, so 400,000 of flow maximum, and on average 10,000 to 100,000 of flow. In the second case, here we're just concentrating on the switch side. Since the switches and the servers are routing data, we had from like few thousands to tens of thousands of flaws per switch. So even with all this variation, we maintain to do with many a compression by maintaining 1,000 rule in all the switches. We had an average sometimes 400 or even 100. And in maximum case, we had the exact 1,000 number of rules per switch. So the average compression ratio was more than 80%, and in some cases, it reached 99%. And it took less than 15 milliseconds to compute. So here it's only the computation, not the installation, since we're more in a simulated environment. We then compared MINI with XPath. Remember, in the related work, I said there's XPath that does compression based on the path ID. So they identify a path ID for every flaw. And then they do a previous compression and the path based on the path ID, which is based on the network prefix. So it's like more of network prefix uh, aggregation. We compare uh, MINI to XPath, we notice that by taking the results that they had in their papers for the same topologies, we compared with MINI, we notice that MINI performs better. And it should be noted here that for XPath, they do compression only between top of rack switches, so not between server and server, it's only between top of rack switches. So we did the same thing for MINI in this case. So all in all, MINI compresses SDN rules using aggregation by source, destination, and by the default rule. We should have seen that it's both efficient and scalable, and it has an 80% average compression efficiency without negative impact on the end user traffic. So that's for MINI. So what I'm working on now in my lab is that first I'm working in collaboration with Massimo, one of my colleagues on ClickNF, which is modular stack for custom network functions, and I'm currently interested in working on M2M augmented interaction, network real-time uh, real problems, and leveraging artificial intelligence in the network. So if any of you is interested in collaborating in one of the topics, I'll be welcome to uh, collaborate. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I was wondering, uh, when you, you told that uh, you compute a compressed table and then you overwrite uh, the whole previous uh, yeah. programming table, 
uh, what happens in the meantime? And when we start to update and uh, until we we're still it. receiving the new packets, we're still routing them, forwarding them, as if nothing's happening. In the meantime, you mean by the time that, okay, we are sending the compressed table to the switch. Some packets, indeed, if they don't find the rules, they might be transferred to the controller by the time the rules were already installed. So does it mean that some packets are forming according to the new rule and some by the old rule? Uh, no, no, because we're flushing the old uh, table, because if you have to do uh, an update, like a consequential update, it's we are going to impact the performance of the switch. The SNS switch is impacted by an update, so we had to do a single uh, action to remove all, everything and then install the whole new table. Okay, and there, there is no possible to batch uh, back of updates or uh, things like, like this, for example? You can do that, however, the performance would be, uh, it would take more time. Yes. to install the compressed table instead of having uh... Okay, and a second question. Uh, you told that uh, when you are, uh, you observe some uh, throughput uh, drops when you are updating the forwarding table. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, since the forwarding is basically the same uh, before and after the compression, mm -hmm. you understand well, uh, why do we observe some losses or uh, throughput uh, drops? The, uh, yeah, because these times when you don't have the rule, because remember I said you remove all the rules from the SDN switch and you're installing the new ones. So if in that particular moment uh, okay. where you removed all the rules and you're still installing the new ones, a packet arrived, mm -hmm. it's not going to be dropped, but it's going to be sent to the controller. So its delay is going to increase by the time uh, okay. that you install the... Uh, okay. Thank you. So, you Question and that makes sense. In many, you have a routing module and a compression uh, yeah. module. And would you win something if you get rid of the routing module and install the compression module uh, in a distributed way, each SDN uh, switch? Uh, so you could get rid of the, the communication between but the uh, controller and the switches? In this case, you're c not considering as SDN. You want everything, so you want to. Locally. Local optimization of each SDN switch to try to compress by source by destination. You you can uh, do that, but in that case, you need the uh, intelligence to be placed on the SDN. So you have to modify the SDN devices. Like in the system wise, you have to modify these devices to be able to do this uh, compression mechanism locally. And in this case, it means that they already have all the rules. So in the case, if they already have all the rules of all the flows that are coming, because you don't have a centralized uh, controller you anymore. Do it for the current rules that they have. Exactly. So you do it at the very beginning, and uh, you don't have it to be dynamic. But it can be done. But in this case, you're just considering that you want to put the intelligence on the switch, so you can delegate it. But you're getting out a bit of the concept of SDN. So. I have a question about multiple compressions, one after the other. So once catch all the rules, and then you call calls for the exceptions. Mm. I was wondering what happens when you recompress something like that. So basically, you, you are basically trying to make a new catch-all rule out of the old catch-all rule? No. So that's the thing. If you want to do a new catch-all rule from the, old, from the compressed rule, we might not get an optimal solution. So on the controller, we, we already know all the rules. So we have the plain version. Exactly, of all the basic rules, because in case some flaws also uh, vanish in the network, and then you have to know this information to modify to modify also the SDN rules, because otherwise you might open yourself to network security vulner vulnerabilities. There, there is no advantage in incrementally compressing because you throw away everything and start from scratch every recompression. Yeah, you're starting from scratch. Yeah, you're not basing yourself on the uh, old topology. And my question it's is, is there an advantage? Would there be a possible advantage in keeping the previous results of compression for? We did it on the algorithmic side. It was not worth it because sometimes you had uh, longer compression tables or you had tables that didn't mean any sense because you had compression. You can compress the first time by source. The second time, it could be by destination. So if you start mixing a lot these tables, at some point, you might arrive to uh, incoherences between uh, the rules. So some of the rules might be installed, but they are useless. So Any other question? Thank you.